Parodi model and Sunit Tuma. Punilla better that way. So, yes, we are talking about civil suits and trademarks, and we are discussing about what trademark is all about after a brief understanding of what civil suits are all about. Civil suits are uh, the proceedings that are initiated before a civil court, and among other things, civil suits are also filed for trademarks. So, we are discussing now about what trademarks are all about. Trademark is nothing but a source indicator. So anything and everything that indicates a particular source with a particular goods can be anything. It can be a word, as I said, it can be a color combination of color, it can be a label, it can be a device, it can even be a sound, it can be smell. Now the first four that I talked about, name, phrase, label, device, color, pipe, all those are called conventional trademarks. Because they are, they are easily capable of graphical representation. When you take the trademark act, it defines mark and also a trademark. When it talks about a mark, it says whatever I just listed, all of them can be a mark or a combination of it can be a mark. But when it happens, when it has to be a trademark, it has to have a graphic. It has to be graphically represented. So, uh, when you're talking about trademark, you have a separate legislation for it, which is called the Trademarks Act, which is where mark, trademark, and anything and everything that pertains to trademarks are all defined. And, uh, the procedure has been laid down as to how it is to, how it is to be registered. Procedure has been laid down as to how what has to be done if someone else is using your mark, how you can protect your mark, and what are the rights and liability rights and duties that are available to you as far as the trademark is concerned. Right? Uh, so So now we have a basic understanding of rudimentary understanding of what a trademark is all about. Once you know that there is something called a trademark which indicates your source, then the problem immediately arises when someone else starts using your trademark. Right? Now, when you when you have a trademark, it is advisable that you get it registered. Registration of trademark is uh, registration of trademark is mandatory as in it provides you with the right to seek for an infringement because it gives you a registration certificate which has a prima facie validity to say that yes, this mark belongs to this person, be it an individual or a company as in an individual person or a juristic person. Therefore, once you get it registered, a certificate is issued to you which, is a, which has a prima facie validity. Now, what does it entail? It entails, the registration of a trademark entails a statutory protection. Statutory protection against infringement, which is defined in Class, I mean, section 29 of the trademark. Now, what do you get out of the registration, first of all, before getting into section 29 as to what is infringement is all about? What do you get out of a registration? By registration, 
you get a statutory right to say that this mark is exclusively belongs to belonging to you this exclusive right <clears throat> is not only an exclusive right for you to use it is an exclusive right to use in exclusion to others there is a big difference between the two you are given an exclusive right that right may also be non exclusive as in exclusive not only to you it can also be given to that person that person it can also be given to that person but it is an exclusive right given in exclusion to others which means whenever a trademark is registered that particular trademark only you can use and other person cannot use right so it is an exclusive right given in exclusion to others this is defined that it is entire effect of registration is covered under section 28 of the trade laws section 28 talks about what is the effect of you getting a registration of a trade apart from this exclusive rights section 28 also talks about a situation where two persons parallelly apply for registration but still get it for the same mark ultimately the registering authority is a human so to err is human therefore by some freak or In when when we are in practice uh, practice of trademark uh, registrations, we know that this happens all the time. That same trademark will be registered uh, uh, for two different people. If that is the case, trademark act addresses that those two will still have exclusive right as far as others are concerned, but between them, they can't fight. As in, one will not be better than the other. so if you get a registration and you also get a registration you can sue the person next to you but not the other person who also has the registration these are in short as short as possible these are the effect of registration of a trade now after registration what if the other person uses mm-hmm. your mark mm-hmm. yes sir mm-hmm. definitely no no correct 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 fantastic 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 question fantastic question this is where section 27 comes into play see i was i was talking first about infringement because that is a statutory remedy that is available to you there is another remedy which is under the common law right common law is nothing but something that we understand out of basic uh, it, it's 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 very basic it is understood by uh, logic so what is the logic here the logic here is that any person who has a trademark and who has been using the trademark in the course of his business for a for a specific period of time subsequent entrant shall not use the same i have a mark upon which i trade a subsequent entrant shall not do it is very similar to what uh, sir uh, uh, was asking as in fine i have a house i have been living in that another person cannot also come and live in that because it is mine i come to that i come to that i come to that i come to that so 
this is infringement and this is passing law right so this common law remedy is called passing law as in he is passing himself off as somebody else trying to say that though i am me i am trying to say that i am him selling under a different person's trademark right so this is common law of passing law so now common law of passing law is available to a person irrespective of his registration because it is a common law it is not confined by the statute on the other hand a registration and consequently an infringement action based out of a registered trademark will be confined by the statute as in its four boundaries are given in the trademark act what can and what cannot be done on the other hand passing off is a whole field which is outside or it encompasses infringement also it come it encompasses registration therefore even a registered proprietor or a proprietor of a trademark who hasn't got a trademark registered can still claim for a passing off now passing off has three main considerations one is that you need to have a goodwill and reputation over a particular mark to claim passing off you need to have a goodwill and reputation over a particular mark number 2 there has to be some kind of a misrepresentation with regard to the particular mark now when i say misrepresentation it doesn't necessarily involve involve fraud i am saying it doesn't necessarily involve fraud a misrepresentation can even be innocuous innocent without knowledge therefore knowledge is an added factor if i knew about someone else's mark but i choose to use that then it amounts to a willful misrepresentation but passing off principle criteria doesn't require a willful misrepresentation it says misrepresentation is okay therefore there has to be a misrepresentation with regard to the trademark number 3 owing to that misrepresentation the person having or the or the user of the trademark the, the prior adopter ought to have had some loss or a likelihood of loss now the loss also need not be quantifiable i don't have to say that i have actually lost or i have actually lost this much i can still make out a case for passing off with a likelihood of loss as in let us assume in a given year i will be selling let us say apples i will be selling 4 kg of apples under x mark now that x mark has been used by somebody else who is passing off his own apples under the very same mark now that passer that person who is passing off let us assume he sells 2 kg in the same year i may or may not sell 4 or less than 4 kg but considering that he has sold 2 kg there is a possibility that i might have sold 5 kg or 6 kg that is called a likelihood of loss possibility of loss so the possibility of loss the likelihood of confusion uh, which is, which presupposes the possibility of loss all these are uh, these are the three conditions right passing off being a common law principle doesn't require a registration as i said but what it does require is priority in use you need to be prior in point of time vis a vis the other person whom you are having a uh, issue about as far as the passing of the case 
now answering the first question he says i have been using the mark since january 2000 the other person has been using the mark since january 2001 both of us have got it registered under 28 section 283 i might not have an infringement action against you because i cannot agitate against your registration as in i mean i cannot agitate against you for infringement because of your registration but i still can succeed in a case for passing because passing off is immati as as far as passing off is concerned it is immaterial whether you are a registered proprietor or not all that is required is that you have to prove that you are a prior entrant in the market and that you have a reputation and that there is a misrepresentation and that there is a likelihood of confusion and a result of loss if you can prove that irrespective of bar under section 28 vis a vis the two registered proprietors they can still agitate a case for pass ultimately the person who has used before has an upper hand yes let us assume for a moment as uh, sir pointed out a person starts using in january 2000 the other person starts using in january 2001 but the person start who started using in january 2001 got it registered in february 2001 hypothetically but the person who started using in january 2000 got it registered only in 2010 there is a saving protection that is there under the trademark act under section 35 30 the saving registration is 34 which says that merely because you are a registered proprietor prior registered proprietor doesn't mean that you have a right against a prior user therefore it is the use which is paramount and not registration as far as trademark civil suits as far as trademarks is concerned right so this is with regard to the rights pertaining to the trademark and then now coming to the infringement that is the violation of the trademark concern there are of course two ways in which the violation could be tackled one is the civil way civil remedies are there and then the trademark act also provides for criminal remedies for the purpose of today's discussion i am only taking the civil remedies so the civil remedies so uh, what amounts to violation has to be first defined which is defined under section 29 of the act Now, section twenty-nine is an interesting provision, which lists out the various kinds of infringement. What if the person, or the other person, is using the same mark in respect of same goods? What if the mark is slightly different, but the goods are same? What if the mark is the same but the goods are slightly different what if the mark is also slightly different goods are also slightly different what if the mark is identical but the goods are completely different a person has a registration for a for apple the other person who is using it is seen to be using a for uh, let us say oranges it's a hypothetical case i'm not talking about you don't take it as apple being a fruit and orange being a fruit they are deceptively similar no don't go into the nitty gritty i'm talking about the rudimentary facts as to what section 29 is talking about what if that is the scenario trademark act answers that you have to prove if you want to cut across classes if let us say apple falls under class 1 hypothetically assume apple class falls under class 1 orange class falls under class 10 they are completely different classes 
And incidentally, let me just explain what classification of trademarks is all about. Classification is nothing but it classifies right from agricultural products to services. Right? Each set of classes has similar goods or goods coming out of some common source, common resource, not source. And they are grouped into segregated classifications. Now, the class one is usually agricultural products. Class three is uh, cosmetics, soap, detergents, puja products, agarbatis, incense. Class five is for pharmacies, pharmaceuticals. I'm just giving you an example. Class 5 is covering only pharmaceutical goods, medicines and pharmaceutical goods, be that for human consumption or for non-human consumption. Class 16, stationery, pens, clips, pencils. Class 29, unprocessed food products. 30 for processed food products. Then from up until 1 to 34, it is classification which deals with goods. From 35 to 45, 11, 10 classes, only in respect of services, various different kinds of services. For example, uh, scientific and technological services, 42. Early communication services, 38. Courier services, 39. Everything under the sun will find its place in classification only if you properly search. Everything under the sun. You can bring it under one classification. So now coming back to cutting across classes. A is using the mark for Apple which falls under one class. B, I mean, uh, the other person is using the same mark A for oranges, which is falling under the different class. What is the relief? Trademark Act says, if A for apple is so sufficiently reputed in India, and the adoption by the other person is capable of causing some disrepute to the reputation of this A, then there is a possibility of you cutting across classes and hitting them. Real life example, let us take Tata. We know Tata is there in everything. Let us erase that. Let us first say Tata is only in respect of, let us say, automobiles. There is one person who is using Tata in respect of, let us say, electronics. Now, Tata has to prove that it is reputed throughout India. And because of that reputation, if the other person is using it, there is a possibility of my reputation going down. There is a possibility of there being a dilution to my reputation and goodwill. If I can prove that, if Tata can prove that, then they can definitely cut across classes and stop the person who is using it in respect of it. Next will be what 29 is addressing. I'm just talking about what are all the scenarios where 29 is addressing. 29 is also addressing what if I have a business name, somebody else is using my business name. Section the section 29 is also addressing the issue of comparative advertisement, disparaging advertisement. As in, any person who tries to disparage my mark through any means, then the such disparagement, though strictly the disparagement, when you when you see disparagement, you can understand that through disparagement, no person is attempting to say that his product is this. Disparagement is usually to denigrate or put down another mark. Trademark Act says, even if it is used in respect of a disparaging statement or an advertisement for that matter, 
that will also move to an input. There are a lot of examples. <laughs> And uh, you know, you cannot say that your product is better, you cannot discover that your product is better. See, when so, it comes to. Uh, a lot of examples. Lot of examples. Brand there are a lot really of examples. Good. Currently, two cases are going on in Madras. Yeah. Really Currently, really three cases. Really no, I, I, I had the Rikit Pinkai Sarod and the suits uh, are there. Yeah, really yes, really yes, really that is also really has been there for a while. So, other two are Rikit Benkaiser. One is uh, for Detol, the other one is for uh, um, email. What was that? The other product. Uh, what was the other product? Uh, email is ITC. The other one, Rikit Benkaiser is uh, Lysol. Lysol versus email. There are a lot of real life, yeah, real life examples. Mm. Orlix versus Complan. Complan versus Orlix. Both are not. No, oh, no. Complan is a different company. Horlix is a different company. Boost is a different company. Boost is Boost and Horlix, I think, one company. company. So, a disparagement is also an infringement, another form of infringement. So, this is what Section Twenty Nine talks about. What amounts to infringement? So, if you want to file a case against somebody else for misuse or violation of your registered trademark, you necessarily have to be in the four corners of the provision under section 20. So that is what section 29 talks about. Next to, best, next to most important provision, if you are on the other side of the coin, as such, as, as, as if you are defending a suit for infringement, you need to see if you fall under the defenses or that are also mentioned in the trademarks, which is under class section 30. What all does what use does not amount to infringement. Right. You haven't read one. Section 30 talks about what does not amount to an infringement. So, if you are a defendant, you need to see if you fall under these specific four corners, which are mentioned in these are listed out in the provision for you to defend your use against the printer. But this 30 is not an exhaustive provision, it is an inclusive provision. There are various other real life scenarios which can be taken as a defense over and over what is provided in the provision. Okay. So, these are the defenses. Now, we are coming closer to the topic as in what enables you to file a civil suit as far as a trademark infringement is concerned. Two provisions. Section 134 and Section 135. So, Section 134, if you have trademark set, you can take that or I will read it. Better, I will read it. So, 134 talks about suit for infringement, etc., to be instituted before district court. It's a very deceptive heading. I'll say, I'll, I'll come to the point why it is deceptive. 
going ahead, it says sub clause one, no suit a for the infringement of a registered trademark. Two, relating to any right in a registered trademark. Three, for passing off arising out of the use by the defendant of any trademark which is identical with or deceptively similar to the plaintiff's trademark, whether registered or unregistered. Now, few minutes, few minutes back, I said section 27 gives you the opening for you to claim what is common law remedy. That section 29, which is an, ENA, which is an enabling provision, does not anywhere say it is does not anywhere name it as passing. It just says you have common law over and above what is provided under section 28 and 29. So irrespective of your registration, you have a common law remedy. But the term passing off is used here in section 134, which is to clarify because this is an enabling provision which enables you to file a civil suit. Therefore, if this provision is not clear, then it will open a whole lot of Pandora's box where people will be agitating whether passing off will lie or not. Will lie or not. So this provision is very clear as far as this particular first clause is concerned. Infringement of a registered trademark, any right relating to a registered trademark, three, passing off. So all three shall be instituted in a court not inferior to a district court having jurisdiction to try this. I slightly tweak the provision. It starts with no suit. Slightly confusing. Therefore, I am saying these three kinds of suit will have to be filed before a court not inferior to, not inferior to a district court. As in district court and above. It starts with the district court. Therefore, you cannot file a uh, trademark suit before a sub court or a session, uh, uh, small causes court, all those things. You have to file your civil suit with regard to trademarks, be it infringement or passing off, only before a district court or above. Now, the or above comes to play, play as far as Chennai is concerned, because as far as Chennai is concerned, the District court, the nomenclature of district court will include the city civil court and also the original jurisdiction of the high court. High court will be the principal district court as far as Chennai is concerned. Therefore, suit, civil suit for trademark technically can be filed before both civil court, the city civil court, and also high court. So, these three kinds of suit will have to be filed. Civil suits will have to be filed only before a district court. Right? Second sub clause is very, very important. Why? Because this is where I say the heading is deceptive. For the purpose of clauses A and B, clause A is a suit for infringement and B is a suit relating to any right in respect of a registered trademark. So, clause A and B pertains only to registered trademark. This provision which I am uh, talking about does not apply to passing of actions at all. For the purpose of clauses A and B of subsection 1, a district court having jurisdiction shall, notwithstanding anything contained in the Code of Civil Procedure or any other law for the time being in force, include a district court within the local limits of whose jurisdiction at the time of the uh, institution uh, at the time of institution of the suit or other proceeding the person instituting the suit or proceeding or where there are more than one such person any of them actually and voluntarily resides or carries on business or personally works for gain this is where the subterfuge comes why I call it as a subterfuge is the trademark side says, be it registered or unregistered, you can proceed under common law. 
The Trademark Act also says an infringement is a statutory remedy, and if you are a registered proprietor, you can claim for an infringement. Then the Trademark Act also goes on to say that only a district court will have a right to take up matters with regard to trademark infringement and passing. But there is an additional jurisdiction that is given to district courts where the plaintiff resides or carries on business only in respect of infringement action. What is given under CPC? CPC between section 16, uh, 16 to 20 talks about the various jurisdictions in respect of various kinds of cases. Mobile property, uh, sorry, immobile property, uh, spe uh, uh, specific performance, two or more properties. So, This is 20. So 16 to 20 talks about the various places, various jurisdictions, defines various jurisdictions in respect of various types of cases. 20 being a residual clause, it talks about whatever is not there in section 16 to 19, uh, between section 16 to 19, will be covered under 20 as far as immobile property is concerned, where two things are given. One, wherever the defendant is residing or carrying on business. Or Cause of action, wherever it is taking place, these two places will have jurisdiction. Now, what uh, subterfuge has been carried out as far as 134 is concerned is over and above section 20, the trademark side gives an additional jurisdiction to file a suit for infringement in a place where the plaintiff resides or carries on business. Therefore, ordinarily, I will be covered under section 20. If this provision is if this provision was not there, 134.2 was not there, I will be ordinarily covered under section 20 of CPC. Or as far as Madras High Court is concerned, I will be covered under clause 12. Which, which also talks about what is the original jurisdiction of the Madras High Court and what cases can be filed within that original jurisdiction. All the cases can be filed. Therefore, I will be covered under 20 and 12. Section 134.2 gives an additional forum. Wherever the plaintiff is deciding or carrying on business, the plaintiff can file a suit there. The, the object of this provision is to enable a right holder to conveniently file a suit against infringement of his mark because a right as such is provided throughout the country. For a person who is getting a mark registered here in, let us say, Kanyakumari, can extend his right up until the boundaries of India, wherever it is. The northernmost, southernmost, easternmost, westernmost. It covers the entire area. Therefore, if I have a right and it is being infringed when I am in Kanyakumari, we have a right and it is being infringed in, let us say, uh, Manipur. Simultaneously at Chandigarh, simultaneously at uh, Kumaragam. What will I do? I can't be chasing the defendants all throughout India. Therefore, this small additional forum has been given by the provisions of Trademark Act, which enables the plaintiff to file wherever he is, which is a district court in Kanyakumari. A district court in Kanyakumari will have the jurisdiction by virtue of section 134.2 to call up a person at Manipur or Chandigarh or Kumarakam to come before him to answer the plaint. But this is available only for a registered proprietor. Okay. You want to find that is right. I said? What is it? If he doesn't know that. You you can't be uh, found fault with something that you don't know. No, no. Hmm. Lila, you yeah. correct. If you know, no, no. He says he doesn't know. No, he not. doesn't know if you are if you are ignorant, ignorant you are in bliss. Happy. Ignorant, you are in bliss. But if you are knowledgeable, but you still keep quiet, then you lose your right. 
because as far as trademark infringement is concerned i thought i'll come a little later as far as trademark infringement is concerned whenever an infringement is taking place each day will give rise to a fresh cause of action if for example today i am infringing a trademark the person who owns the right as far as the trademark is concerned starts accruing the right to file a civil suit against me i do it tomorrow quarter to marudim podu i do it day after tomorrow again fresh cause of action recurring cause of action so to come back to your question if you don't know and the person has been using for let us say 12 years 12 years as far as property is concerned 12 or more years with knowledge becomes adverse right 12 years he uses but i don't know the moment i come to know i file a suit against him i won't be hit by delay or latches unless otherwise he is able to prove that i know and i will keep that is where delay latches and acquisitions will come delay will be there delay will be there see delay is something that happens irrespective by span of time delay will happen but delay per se is not fatal you won't lose your right it is only because of latches and acquisitions which uh, by which you will lose your right because that is when there is a willful silence which comes into play yes sir. no problem sir so yes yes so this is 134 2 it gives an additional forum it gives an additional forum to registered trademark holder in respect of infringement allowed this additional forum is not there for a passing of action because as far as passing of is concerned you didn't take your pains to go and get registered right why would the statute come to play to come to uh, help you the statute will not come to help you so you will have to go by the standard procedure which is under cpc idlame civil suit tha the additional forum is not available to you right so this is 134 which talks about the uh, where the suits have to be filed i mean in which court the uh, court has, suit has to be filed and where it has to, it can be filed i'm not saying it has to be it can be filed because you still have section 20 if you want to follow the defendant and go there and hit him you can you are still entitled to do that nothing stops you you want to come under 134 too you can do it but if you want to no no i will go to uh, manipur i will go to chandigarh i will go to kumar you can very well do it. no nothing stops you that is why i said it is an additional forum it doesn't supplant whatever is there 20 cpc is not taken away tcpc is also there this is also there right so this is 134 135 talks about the various reliefs that you can claim in respect of an infringement or a passing infraction now this becomes very crucial as far as civil suit is concerned because civil suit is all about what you can and what you are claiming prayer is the most vital part of a civil suit because if you don't ask for it you don't get it therefore the trademark act under section 135 lists out what you can ask i'll read that the relief which a court may grant in any suit for infringement or for passing off referred to in section uh, section 134 includes injunction subject to such terms as the court thinks fit so you can you you can ask only for a specific kind of injunction set for as a for example a prohibitory injunction mandatory injunction 
a permanent injunction asking him to stop using it or asking him not to come uh, 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 knocking my doors when i am using it not to distract my i mean not not to stop my use these are the kinds of injunctions that you can ask so injunction number 1 <clears throat> and at the option of the plaintiff either damages or accounts of harm therefore under the trademarks act you can either ask for damages or accounts of profit they both are money related they both are recovering whatever you have lost or mm-hmm. you see you say you have lost therefore you can do two ways one you can liquidate it and put it up before the court saying that this is what i have lost i i want this to be awarded as damages or you can say i don't know what i have lost because what i have lost can be taken back uh, can be valued from what he has gained therefore allow me to have his profits accounts of his profits based on that i will once again uh, i will i will uh, then modify my prayer as far as what damages can be asked by me what damages can be awarded to me in respect of the infringement and past therefore whenever it comes to accounts of profit there will always be a preliminary decree the preliminary decree will be you are asking for infringement injunction uh, the accounts of profit and then others that i am going to say the court will say a yes permanent decree other c yes decree d decree b i will give you a preliminary decree because i will direct him to produce his accounts books of accounts and then the procedure will be slightly uh, followed there the books of accounts will be considered all these things and then the accounts will be arrived at and what profits have been uh, taken by him will be arrived at and then final decree will come as far as accounts of profits so either damages or accounts of profit together with or without any order for delivery up of infringing labels and marks for destruction or erasure now this erasure prayer delivery up and erasure prayer is very vital because an infringement of trademark as far well as let us say goods or services even for that matter you will find the use of trademark in various ways for example if you have let us say goods manufactured and put it in put it in a put in the market with the trademark that will involve right from the manufacturing process till the marketing process various materials your main board will be there stationery will be there you will be having molds dies for uh, for the purpose of printing you will be printing advertisement materials you will be printing various other uh, uh, other uh, uh, logistical uh, things everything all those things can be brought to the court for the purpose of destruction because it bears the trade the impugn destruction which enables which which ensures that that particular infringing trademark is never put across to the real world so destruction for the i mean delivery up for the purpose of destruction so these are the three prayers that you can ask for essentially injunction damages or accounts of profit delivery delivery up delivery up for destruction so these are the three general prayers that you can ask main prayers that you can ask in a suit for infringement of pass then of course whenever uh, statute says interim inj- i mean injunction can be granted it will subsume that there can be an ad interim injunction also pending disposal of the suit. the trademark act provides specifically that a temporary ad interim injunction can also be granted pending disposal of the suit and apart from the discovery of documents uh, preserving the infringing goods uh, all these things as ad interim injunction can be granted
Correct. Correct. Accounts of profit to put over him. Yes, it is like that. Damages you will have, if you are claiming liquidated damages, then you will have to prove liquidated damages. As far as damages is concerned, when you are correct, when you are confirming that, let us say ten lakhs you have asked for as damages. You are saying ten lakhs is the amount that I have lost that is to be given to me as damages. If you are saying that, you will have to prove that ten lakhs. Correct. So if you prove for five lakhs, only five lakhs. That's all. Actually. So, this one thirty-five, apart from saying what you can get, is also providing a a a kind of a leeway for a defendant to say what, in which cases I will not be bogged down by. Other leaves except injunction, because injunction is a staple. As far as trademark injunction, trademark infringement and passing off is concerned, injunction is a staple. I have a right. You don't have a right. I can ask you to stop. But when it comes to damages or accounts of profit and destruction, delivery of all those things, there are situations when the plaintiff cannot enforce those rights against the defendant. Which is covered under subsection three of section one thirty, where specific scenarios are given. I'll read it. Notwithstanding anything contained in subsection one, the court shall not grant relief by way of damages other than nominal damages or on accounts of profits in any case. A Wherein a suit for infringement of the trademark, the infringement complained of is in relation to a certification trademark. When it comes to a certification trademark or a collective trademark, there is very limited damages that you can actually be in count claim because you don't sell those marks. You don't sell under those marks. Certification is your ISI, AG mark, BSI. Those are certification trademarks. They are not used for selling any products. they are there to certify the quality or the source or whatever it is as far as the particular goods are concerned therefore as far as certification or collective trademark is concerned you cannot claim for damages you, the court cannot grant you a damages relief for damages two where in the suit for infringement the defendant satisfies the court that at the time he commenced the use of trademark he was unaware of the complaint trademark when he says that at the time when i was using it i didn't know but the moment i came to know i stopped it but you have to prove that right that is what b talks about and he was unaware and then when he came to know about it he stopped and then c this is species only in respect of passing off where in a suit for passing off the defendant satisfies the court that at the time he commenced the use of the trademark complaint of He was under what? What is there for infringement is also there for the passing. Therefore, as far as trademark suit is concerned, when you are on the other side, as far as the defendant is concerned, you have defences under class. I mean, section thirty. You also have defence under section one thirty five, where if you can prove that you were not aware of the plaintiff's trademark, and as soon as you became aware of the plaintiff's trademark, you stopped using it, you escaped it. right so this broadly is the scope of what can be claimed in a civil suit as far as a trademark infringement and passing off right no one lama i will just run through what is required as far as the suit is concerned yes, i will just run through these are uh, certain pointers that you should know when you are drafting or uh, filing or arguing a civil proceeding as far as a trademark uh, issue is concerned right first of all you guys will know that there is something called a commercial courts act as far as uh, 2015 onwards 
that particular legislation has come into being. Now that particular legislation is segregating certain kinds of civil suits. It is for civil suits only. Commercial court is only for civil. It's, it's, it's only, it's, it only talks about civil suits. Only talks about civil courts. Civil courts and proceedings before civil courts. I am not. Uh, I, I should not actually say that it is only for civil suit because it has also has other applications and other things. It is only talking about civil matters, right? So, as far as Chennai is concerned, as far as well, let us first see what uh, it has a bearing over Tamil Nadu entirely. As far as civil uh, commercial courts act is concerned, each district will have a commercial court. Now there are notification from the Tamil Nadu government, which says that the principal district judge will also be the commercial judge and therefore his court will also be the commercial court. Right? So what and this is in respect of the other districts of Tamil Nadu. What is the situation as far as Chennai is concerned? Because Chennai is always specious. As far as Chennai is concerned, though we got independence from 1947, we are still bound by letters patent which was granted to Chennai by the British. When there is a letters patent which governs the Madras High Court, that letters patent specifically states that Original civil jurisdiction, as far as Chennai is concerned, Madras is concerned, the High Court will be the principal court. Having this in mind, apart from Chennai, apart from Madras High Court, there are few other High Courts which also hold the same kind of letters patent, whereby they have original jurisdictions with them. Not all High Courts will have original jurisdiction. It is only chartered High Courts. Those chartered high courts are chartered because they have been given patent by the crown. Patent is nothing but a declaration given by the crown. Any declaration given by the crown is called, any, any authority given by the crown is called a patent. That is how patent as in a right IPR patent comes from. Side note. So a letters patent was granted by the British Crown, whereby the Madras High Court, apart from inter alia other courts, few other courts, have become has become a chartered High Court, and only these chartered High Courts usually have the original jurisdiction. There is only one exception, which is the Delhi High Court. Correct me if I'm wrong. The Delhi High Court, I don't think, is a chartered High Court, but Delhi High Court also holds the original jurisdiction. <laughs> yeah, we're slowly. Yeah, but uh, they also have civil suits. <laughs> As far as commercial suits are concerned, commercial division suits are also there. So, when, so, so, yes, so understanding this anomaly as far as chartered high courts are concerned, which also has the original jurisdiction, when, when the Commercial Courts Act came in, it talks about two different courts. One is commercial court, as in a civil court which has the commercial jurisdiction, and commercial division of a high court, which is there in Madras High Court and is also there in various other chartered high courts, where chartered high courts have original jurisdiction. Therefore, as far as Chennai is concerned, the commercial division of Madras High Court has the right to take up certain type of cases which are defined as commercial dispute under the commercial principle. Now, apart from the disputes having to be defined as, as such, the, the, uh, having to have, I mean, apart from the disputes having to fall under the four corners of commercial dispute, 
they also have one additional step which also has to be fulfilled one additional precondition which is the pecuniary limit which is called the specified value ha ah, previously it was 3 1 1 crore illa illa modalla 1 crore irundhuchu illa ipo ipo it is 3 lakhs it used to be 1 lakh no it used to be 1 crore so when the commercial courts act came into being the specified value was uh, meant to be uh, uh, or codified to be 1 crore and above thereafter it was brought down to 3 lakhs it still remains as 3 lakhs but as far as high courts the commercial division as far as our madras high court is concerned it is still 1 crore there is a notification to the tipper so be that as it may so this is an additional precondition which also has to be uh, fulfilled for a suit to be taken up by uh, for commercial dispute to be taken up by the commercial court right there is an exception there or couple of exceptions there one is that I mean it's the only thing with basically one exception which is wherever a statute says that proceedings civil proceedings under this statute or under the uh, 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 in respect of the violations that are mentioned in this statute are to be done in a court not inferior to a district court whenever a statute says that then commercial division will automatically or commercial court will automatically assume jurisdiction irrespective of the specified value there are two basic categories which fall under this one being ip act ip ip laws because all ip laws across the board say have similar provision to 134 of the trademarks act which says that a suit pertaining to this particular right cannot be filed before any court inferior to a district court across the board so ip laws have been so now immediately you have trademarks you have copyright you have patent you have designs you have geographical indication your plant varieties all these things but these five patent trademark design copyright and geographical indication these definitely will fall only under the commercial court or the commercial division irrespective of specified value so they don't have to for a, for a trademark suit you don't have to have a specified value of more than 3 lakhs or 1 crore whatever it be for you to be considered as a commercial dispute for the commercial court to take it. the second broad category is under the arbitration which also has a similar provision therefore a trademarks i mean as uh, i mean as on date any suit with regard to a trademark issue be it an infringement suit or a passing of suit or whatever it be it has to be filed only before a commercial court or the commercial court will only have the jurisdiction to handle such matters as far as chennai is concerned it is the high court that is the commercial division which has the jurisdiction appropriate jurisdiction to handle such matters therefore you need to understand before filing a civil suit you need to understand in which jurisdiction it will fall territorial jurisdiction therefore pecuniary jurisdiction is now out of question whatever is there whatever was there under the uh, cpc that is now out of question now it is only the commercial courts act amend cpc as amended by the commercial courts act which will act which will have a role to play mm. that is that there were so as far as pecuniary jurisdiction is it is out of question as far as trademark suits are concerned but you still have to fall under the broad uh, jurisdictional uh, territorial jurisdictional aspect of 16 to 20 as given cpc and as far as uh, trademark act is concerned you have to also you also have an additional form under section 120 
Therefore, for you to file a commercial suit for trademark infringement or passing off, you need to first understand under which, terri which territorial jurisdiction you want to file. You can file. If you are the plaintiff, you are present in a particular place, you can file a suit there. You can file a suit there in that district, in that district court, in that commercial court, wherever you are. If that place of business of plaintiff is in Chennai, you have to understand if it falls within the territorial limits of Madras IQ. Now, when you call, when you say Chennai, there are umpteen number of places in Chennai which doesn't fall under the original jurisdiction of Madras IQ. But High Court has its own jurisdiction limits. That is given to so you need to fall within that jurisdiction for you to file a suit before the Madras court. Right? So you need to understand the territorial limit for you to file a civil suit. That is number one. Number two, you also need to know where the defendant is residing or carries on business. If Apart from the plaintiff, the defendant is also residing within the jurisdiction. Then it makes your life easy because all your infringement action will also have to have a passing of money. Right? Because infringement is available only for registered trademark, but passing off is irrespective of registration, you can have passing off. And passing off is a much more wider remedy. Therefore, any suit for infringement we should also have a relief for passing off. So it will be it will be a twin barrel. Then. You will ask for infringement prayer and also I mean, a permanent injunction for infringement and also a permanent injunction for passing off. Yes, it's a double barrel. Therefore, but you can though you can ask for both, you need to have jurisdiction for both within the same court. If you don't have that then it will not be possible for you to claim for a permanent injunction of infringement and passing off when the jurisdictional aspect is not properly covered. But the letters patent gives you an edge there rather than your CPC. Because under letters patent, you have what is called a leave uh, I mean, uh, leave to combine causes of action. It is covered under clause 14 of letters patent. Very important provision. So, under the clause, uh, under that clause, what letters patent gives the ordains the high court to do is that if there are multiple causes of action against which the plaintiff is assailing the defendant. But of them, one cause of action falls within the one or two cause of actions fall within the jurisdiction, but then one or two causes of action does not fall within the territorial jurisdiction of the uh, High Court. The High Court has the power to call up all of them, to combine all the causes of action and itself hear the matter. Therefore, for you to file a civil suit for infringement of trademark and passing off, assuming you are within the jurisdiction, but the defendant is not, you anyway under section 134 have a right to claim for infringement before this Madras court because the 134 provides you an additional forum, which additional forum is not available for passing off action or passing off to also come within the jurisdiction, you can file or you can seek a leave under clause 14 letters patent, combine the causes of action so that 
you file a suit here you also file a suit in the place where the other uh, defendant is there as far as passing off is concerned there is a possibility of there being multiplicity of proceedings and diametrically opposite orders being passed mm -hmm. that is the ground on which you claim for combining the cases assume for a moment you are in chennai the defendant is in let us say kanyakumari kanyakumari is not within the jurisdiction of the madras naturally so for passing of action you need to essentially chase the defendant you go to kanyakumari and file a suit for passing off. but you have an additional forum for infringement matters so you file a matter as a civil suit for infringement in madras high court now you have two suits essentially on same facts assume for a moment madras high court does not grant you a relief but the kanyakumari court district court grants you a relief where do you stand one court says you have yes you are entitled for an injunction against infringement one court says no you don't that will give space to give rise to that that will put the entire endeavor that was taken up by you it will be put to not to avoid that and to also avoid multiplicity of proceedings you can invoke clause 14 let us say and file a suit combined before madras so that is one other thing that needs to be understood because all these will be understood only based on the addresses of the parties so you need to first analyze what the addresses of the parties are how the suit can be filed where you have to file it okay mm -hmm. there is one more option i'll just finish there is one more option here as uh, sir said 20 cpc talks about two kinds of places where the cause of action where the where the suit can be filed one where the defendant one of them or all of them decide two where cause of action partly or in whole arises right same thing is covered under the latest patent also therefore it is not necessary that the defendant has to be there for you to file a suit in a place where the plaintiff is not residing i am talking about i am i am completely pushing aside the place where i mean the the situation discussed under section 134 i am not going into that i am talking about a scenario where the defendant is there or cause of action is there right so where cause of action is there there also you can file a suit right for example infringing product is being sold in let us say salem you have a jurisdiction to file a suit at salem because the actual infringement is taking place at salem irrespective of whether you are there in salem or not irrespective of whether the defendant is there in salem or not cause of action arises there so you need to understand where is the product being sold because that will also give one more see there are as of now we have talked about two avenues one under 134 two where the defendant is three where the cause of action is now there are three ways for you to travel three places where you can go this gives you option this gives you option to choose where you want but when you choose it you have to choose it very carefully because once you take that path you cannot come you can withdraw it you will have to withdraw it then you can't uh, you want you will have already uh, uh, your you will you are you can withdraw so will suit you are filing you can withdraw but the defendant will already know now you are after his blood actually sir adula vandu there is one ah uh, that that is there is one departure there because 
as far as as i said infringement action is concerned it has a recurring cause of action blue diamond blue diamond d di and dm as i mean recurs on a daily basis it says on a daily basis remember d di and dm is latin for on a daily basis every day it occurs every day therefore even if i withdraw a suit somewhere that correct correct then the clock starts ticking for you because the more you delay for filing the second suit let us assume latches will start taking place latches nuisance will start accruing so you will have to be very careful it is strategically i am not talking about the legal aspect of it i am talking about the practical aspect of it. you can do you can withdraw but if you withdraw you have various things that you need to understand and take an informed decision before withdrawing because one your clock starts ticking two the defendant is aware of you and then three whenever there is a withdrawal and a fresh suit is being filed the court is going to look at you at a different angle even if there is a valid reason there will always be the presumption something that is to be thought of correct withdrawal is not even a last option correct and the most important a being a civil suit whatever court fee you are paid it will not be given so apart from being strategic loss for you there will also be a loss for the client which also has to be considered right so this as far as jurisdiction where to sue where to file a suit is very important on a practical standpoint right so you need to understand this there are three ways in which three phases in which you could file a suit plaintiff wherever he is residing as far as infringement is concerned when it is passing off action also if it is before the madras high court it is only if it is only before the madras high court you have the option of cross court in litus patent because cross court is only for madras high court district courts there is no yeah, such provision and as far as defendant's jurisdiction is concerned you have to go there and you have to sue him third cause of action where it partly or fully resides take uh, cause uh, takes place so whenever there is an opportunity it is always advisable for you to cover at least two of these three avenues in one case for example you want to file a suit where the plaintiff is residing see if there is any possibility of the cause of action also taking place in chennai as in the products being available if that is there then it gives you an edge it gives you a full proof suit where the defendant cannot simply come and say no no the product is not available i am not carrying out infringement here at all try to cover at least two jurisdiction avenues right then yeah the most important aspect that you need to know is as far as trademark suits are concerned you have to understand if the defendant has filed a replication or has a registration because if you don't do the ground work if you don't do the ground work and proceed to quickly file a suit the client says come on we'll file a suit yes okay we'll file a suit you type it off you file the suit two days hence suit is numbered listed you even get an infringement uh, you get you even get a ex parte relief but day after tomorrow the defendant comes and says i am also a registered with you so this gone so you have the option to continue passing off action as far as infringement the suit is gone there you will be put to an embarrassing situation very embarrassing situation because the client who comes and trusts the matter with you he would know that you have not done your homework properly 
ground work is very important and as far as trademark suits are concerned checking the public records to know if the defendant is actually a registered proprietor or he has filed an application you see that the extra step that you take up saves a lot of time embarrassment money everything right so you need to check there is public record available the trademarks register is a public record there are modalities there uh, online you can check if the trademark is registered or not what if it is applied for what is the status all those things you can check check that cover that base helps you a lot right and very important aspect as far as uh, trademark suits are concerned this is an issue which uh, is often raised whether a cease and desist notice is mandatory or not cease and desist notice is what we call in trademark parlance a pre suit notice before filing a suit for example if you are filing a money recovery suit there is a mandate or there is a necessity for you to first demand that money before making a civil suit before filing a civil suit a similar thing can also be done as far as infringement uh, trademark infringement and passing off is concerned where you can inform the defendant that see i am the owner of the trademark i have these this these these rights why don't you stop using it immediately stop using that otherwise i'll take action against you this is some one substance this is the uh, crux of a trademark pre suit notice cease and desist notice what we are asking him in the notice is to cease stop desist don't do it. cease and desist this is the meaning cease means stop desist means stop doing it further this is what is on cease and desist notice whether it is mandatory or not as far as trademark infringement is concerned my answer is it is important it is vital but it is not mandatory as i said similar to a situation where you also check the public record to know if the other person has registered or not that is one ground that you cover through a basic research cease and desist notice is also another ground that you cover for example you issue a cease and desist notice to some let us say or chota trader he might immediately revert and say sorry i didn't know i will immediately stop using it there is a possibility there is also a possibility this is the pro side this helps you you don't have to prepare a suit you don't have to file it you don't have to go before the court the client does not have to expend money so the flip side is that there are possibilities of the other side either sending a long winding reply saying no i won't and file a case there be effectively stop the queue from getting any ex parte orders but this is something that has to be balanced according to what the client needs the client needs no no i want an urgent order i want him to stop you don't even have to go for civil suit i mean as far as I mean, you don't have to go for a cease and desist notice because it is not mandatory but it is important because it helps you to say various things and there is also a possibility of understanding what the other side thinks about in his reply you file you send a civil uh, cease and desist notice the other side sends a reply he will essentially cover whatever points that he has in his favor in the reply so you know what he is going to talk about so therefore when you file a suit you can give succinct answers to whatever his defenses are going to be in your plain itself which is even better you can ask but it, you can ask you can ask but there won't be a heat in that situation correct you can't ask for an ex parte injunction you can't ask for an injunction per se because if he stops using it sir not see you can practically it doesn't serve any purpose 
even in cases where infringement was going on when the suit was filed, but still after filing the suit, the defendant comes and says, "No, no, please, I'm sorry, I st I, st I, am, I will stop using it. We will settle the matter." Even then, the issue of you pressing on, "No, no, I want compensation," will not work in your favor. This is a practical aspect. I am not talking about the legality. Yes, of course you have a right. Because uh, the uh, Trademark Act under Section 135 says injunction, damages, everything. You don't have to ask for injunction only for you to claim damages. No. You can ask for it, any of the three prayers. But whether it is practically liable or not is something that has to be understood based on the situation. So, this is what I think about the cease and desist notice. Apart from this, uh, let me just give you the various uh, things that needs to be covered in the claim. Just simple pointers. Of course, you guys know what a plaint is all about. What is the structure of the plaint? Long cost title, short cost title, all these things, right? Then. You, the plaint has to necessarily have cause of action, necessarily have jurisdiction, necessarily have valuation, and necessarily have prayer. These are basic necessities. But is there anything that is special as far as trademark is concerned? Yes, there are few. One, you need to explain who the plaintiff is. Unlike other suits, like for example, property suits, where you don't care who the plaintiff is, but you straight away go to the cause of action, you will have to describe it. You will have to describe it. But in, in trademark matters, you, the question of who the plaintiff is does take a prime seat. So you need to explain who the plaintiff is. In explaining, you need to uh, say uh, what kind of a business he is in, what are the goods or services that he is doing I and mean, selling, what is his profit, what is his uh, advertisement expenses, all those things you need to explain. So you need to explain what the plaintiff is, then you need to explain his business, and then you need to explain in detail what the mark that he has registered. You need to devote at least a couple of paragraphs, minimum, bare minimum, couple of paragraphs explaining what the mark is, what is its reputation. Reputation is always gauged through sale. So you need to explain what is its sale, what is the, uh, what are the endeavors that have been taken by you in promoting that particular mark. What are the expenses that you have made as far as the promotion? What are the certifications and awards that you have got as far as commendations that you have got in respect of that mark? All those things will have to be explained. These are the building blocks to prove that your mark has a reputation to begin with. It will. It, it will, it will. That is where you are talking about the plaintiff, you will bring all those things. Yeah, you can. See, the reputation of the, the goodwill of the company will be one of the prime mover as far as the market is concerned. You think about a scenario where a startup today is bringing out a product. And the, and the same product being brought out by Tata. You know what kind of a background it comes from. So the background does matter. You will have, that is why I said, first you explain who the plaintiff is. You explain his business. You explain his reputation, all these things. Then come to the mark. So when you're talking about the mark, you need to explain what the mark is, as in what, when you adopted it, the exact date of adoption, what kind of uh, sale that you have? Yeah. 
I am coming to you. So, whenever you are talking about all these things, you will have to, step by step, you will have to explain them with documents also. You will have to file corroborative documents. So, when are you, whenever you are saying about the, talking about the plaintiff, talk about, I mean, you can uh, have a few documents segregated as far as the plaintiff's reputation is concerned. Then you file documents to show when you adopted the mark. Example being a registration certificate. I am saying a registration certificate is an example of your adoption of the mark. Logo also, logo is also a trademark. Logo can also be registered. You also first mentioned Correct. So what if both the markets are the same trademark and the same product? Yeah. It is also when, the, see, that is the whole purpose of the trademark infringement action is also more about it. Even then, so you will have some scenario only when the person wants. Yes, sir, no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In the scenario, a person was established himself very much in a country like India for the past 50 years. A person was come to the market as a startup for the five years he has been established. So obviously he loses his right with the 50 year person. Right? There also, there also, who adopted the mark? The, the mark in question is the most important thing to be answered. See, let us assume for a moment a startup today, a startup has adopted a mark in 2000. For, I mean, hypothetically, Tata is also doing that. Let us say in 2010. Just because Tata is Tata, it cannot swallow the big fish, a small fish. Because prior user is the most important thing to be considered. That is what I told you in the, in the most in, uh, uh, preliminary stage of the entire discussion. It is always the use which plays the vital role. If you can prove that you have adopted the mark and started using the mark prior to the defendant, even if the defendant is Tata, Lane, Sambani, all those things, it is still an infringement. Prior use and prior registration, there is no balance at all. Prior use is always the bitter. Uh, so be it. Registration does not give you an edge over a prior, adop prior adopter and a prior user. Section 34. Registration, the section 31 says, registration is only a prima facie validity. It is always the prior usage which concerns. When there is a prior user, prior user will always be victorious over and above the prior adopter. One day before and after. One day before and after and all hypothetical. Right? One day hypothetical. See, that is where you come under come with a, a legal this thing, legal uh, principle called honest and concurrent use. When there is a honest and concurrent use, as in what you are saying, I have adopted the mark on this date. You adopted the mark either one day before or, before or after. We are fighting five, day, five years down the line. Where is the question of prior adoption or subsequent adoption? We both will be considered equal on, on the equal footing. Only when you are able to prove that you are prior as in, in practical aspect. We both are on the same footing. But that said, one day prior is also prior. If you are able to prove it. So oh, it, it all comes down to evidence. Correct. When all else is equal. When all else is equal. Correct. So, you have to talk about the mark, adoption, sales, 
sales uh, sales promotion all those things you need to talk about then you have to specifically explain in detail how you came to know about the technology because that is how you will our whether you know the defendant on such and such date and whether you have been keeping quiet allowing him to grow or you have just come to know him so you have to necessarily place facts to show to the court that on so and so and so date you came to know about the defendant and substantiate it with documentary evidence for example you come across a defendant's product on 20th of january 2022 it is always advisable for you to immediately purchase the product with the bill come to the court with that bill to say that i came across this product in the month of january this is the bill that corresponds to my our man now if you if you do that then the onus lies on the defendant to show that no no he knew about it even prior to when you leave everything up in the air i came to know came to know about the defendant recently i immediately come to the court the defendant can simply say that no no he came, he came to he knew about me uh, this is where uh, i uh, both of our products have been uh, simultaneously uh, displayed in the market all those things you prove that this is when i came to know you better file a document you come to know about the defendant in an online uh, e-commerce platform immediately purchase the product have a bill file the bill that will seal the date for you and for the court as far as knowledge of the defendant is concerned so you have to cover the uh, way in which you came to know about the defendant because the way in which you came to know about the defendant is also very vital you find him in the market you find him in the newspaper you find him in the uh, e-commerce website okay all those things needs to be covered because the place where you came to know about the defendant will gives you will give you a jurisdictional standpoint when it comes to e-commerce you will have to necessarily aver in the claim that such and such e-commerce website i came to know about it i that e-commerce website delivers the product everywhere including the city of chennai i can place my orders in that e-commerce website they deliver it to me therefore wherever the product is delivered will have the jurisdiction because the cause of action is taken place here whenever you are uh, trying to assert jurisdiction through a online platform these are the things that you need to actually explain whether they particular website that you are talking about is interactive whether that particular website caters to wherever you are situated whether the uh, product was actually delivered to you in this place whether that website allows you to commercially get the product as well as i mean uh, uh, get the product on a commercial scale sample ko no no whenever you are able to do it if you do it today you will have you should also be in a position to do it tomorrow you should also be in a position to do it tomorrow day after tomorrow you should also be in a position to do it day after i mean the day after not in single uh, one or two samples but in bulk also these things have to be proved mm. he should have known before he is again not shifting the onus on me the onus is still on the defendant because he has to explain how i came to know about it he has to explain my knowledge next is honest use sir that is a defense I'm not saying no but the onus still has not transferred to the plaintiff onus is still on the defendant you have to prove it it won't shift the burden 
it is a it is a plausible argument i am not saying that, no to that but it will not shift the onus you still have to prove that i i knew about it i have seen it is very difficult to prove i understand but still that's what the law demands so uh yeah so you have to explain where you, where when how where you came to know about the dependent and the infringing product and if possible get the product and file document to the dp and also if the product is actually you can transfer i mean you can take the product to the court try to take the product to the court because physical presentation of the product before the court or filing it as a material object in the court will help you in getting the i mean going to that extra effort taking that extra effort so the there is always a possibility of the court moving your you take the two products when you are presenting it as a photograph they might or might not have the same effect but when you are taking the two products and showing it to the judge from a distance he is going to see impression the impression that you found that is important. so whenever you can always take the physical products with you always make a point to post I mean put up a comparative photograph of two products so certain judges want that certain judges don't like that but still it's your duty you do it whether the judge likes it or not depends on its subjective but always produce the two products side by side if possible or one page after the other in types of documents it helps you right and uh, of course all whatever online documents you are making make it a point to file section 65b of so these are the things that you need to of course the as far as documents are concerned you need to essentially file the document to show your first use it can be the registration certificate and of course whenever you are talking about trademark registration certificate you also you can only file a certificate for legal use you cannot file the registration certificate as it is because a registration certificate as it is is not a legally permissible document the certificate itself at the bottom will say that so you will have to get a you will have to file an application before the trademark registry get a get a certificate for use in legal proceedings and file it in the court so certificate invoices to prove sale if possible chartered accountant certificates also to show what is the sales turnover what is the sales promotion expenses that you have incurred if possible put that tabulation in the plaint itself and whenever you are filing chartered accountant certificate ensure that at the time of trial the chartered accountant is brought in the box otherwise the certificate is a waste it is a third party document third party certifications are generally not considered as an evidence unless that particular party who gave the document comes and says that uh, comes and uh, confirms the document so chartered accountant certificate as far as the sales turnover and sales promotion expenses advertisements awards awards and certifications that the product or the mark has got sales turnover that's what the ca certificate is all about and defendant's product how you came up with the defendant's product and the comparison in essence these are the documents that you have to file you have to have to file in this these are the bare minimum over and above if you want to file any further documents feel free provided you be useful always subject to proof and relevancy of course not for really so yes these are the points to be considered and taken to mind put to application while you are filing the civil suit for trademark so any questions